what's the narrative that you're kind of following? And, you know, we'll talk about some videos that you've made. You made a really good Mavericks video and an amazing Celtics video that, by the way, for those of you listening here, we're going to run that at the end of this interview. We're going to run S's video that he made after the Celtics uh, clinched the Eastern Conference. But tell me, S, what, what's the most exciting narratives for you to track in these five? Hmm. I think from Boston's perspective, I would say it's just the like, this is it, you know, this is the shot. And this is this is like this is it's it's all right there for you, you know, um, and it's sort of about seizing that moment and taking that and running with it in stride. And like, you know, people look at narrative as a bad word, right? It's like scary. It's scary to throw out the word narrative because then it just seems like, you know, there's a sort of slant to it. But for what it's worth, there is a like a just a timeline of these stories that happen, right? And naturally, especially with a team like Boston, who has kind of been knocking on the door. And like I said, well, you guys will show the video at the end. But like, you know, a team like Boston that has been knocking on the door for so long, there's this natural bubbling of conversation that happens where it's like, all right, so when will the when will that shoe drop? When will they eventually get to that point where they become champions? And hey, there's no better time than the present. And there's no better time than than now, to be honest with you, because it just feels like this is. This is sort of the moment for them. Uh, yeah, so that's that's probably it from Boston's perspective. On Dallas's side, I just think the interesting thing is, you know, how do you build a team in this age of parity and what is required to get to the finals and potentially win a championship? Because I feel like there is no clear-cut answer, especially in this era, but you're seeing the Mavericks, who last year seemed like they were in shambles, right? Lottery team. You know, what Luca and Kyrie didn't work, the defense, yada, yada, yada. And somehow, some way, they have completely changed this around to get to the point where they're a finals team, a contending team. And so, how do you look at team building from that perspective? I think that's where it gets interesting from Dallas's narrative side, if you will. But obviously, there's like the Luca Kyrie, there's the Kyrie versus Boston. That, you know, I was very I, happy you didn't take the bait on that and just go yeah. directly to Kyrie versus Boston. That that that's a true professional right there. As I, I, I appreciate you. you not not taking that. <laughs> yeah, why not, man? I, I mean, hey, that will be fun too. Like, I, I can't wait for the booze initially. Do you guys think Kyrie's gonna sage TD? Are they gonna <laughs> are they gonna let him do it? Uh, is that is are they just gonna throw away his sage and throw it in the trash? Like, what's gonna happen? I don't know. How much saging needs to happen? Like when you sage something for the first time, is that it? True. Do you need yeah. Multiple rounds you go of back. Staging? Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> I a good don't know. Question. Maybe, maybe that uh, recurses the building for him. But you know, you mentioned it's like the hot team, the Mavs, right? They got really hot towards the end of the season. Um, but kind of similar to how the Celtics turned it around a couple of years back. You know, True. after the Derek White trade, they got really hot. Ended up making it all the way to the finals, probably a year sooner than anybody expected them to really get there, despite having knocked on the door in the past. So it's like the hot team of the moment versus the team of destiny, right? Those are the, the two narratives here because the way that everything fell right for the Celtics this season with all the injuries in the Eastern conference um, yeah. with, you know, even the stuff leading to the Celtics getting Chris Stapps Porzingis and getting Drew Holiday. It's like all of these things are falling into place for the Celtics to get to the finals. Then when you look across the West and you look at the two teams, the Celtics probably would have had the hardest time with were the Denver Nuggets and Minnesota Timberwolves. And the fact that the, Victor Wembenyama game, right? At the end of the season, the Devontae Graham game leads to the Nuggets not getting the first seed, which everybody was sort of expecting. Sure. And now the T-Wolves and the Nuggets play in the second round. We don't have Nikola Jokic. And then the, the T-Wolves, I had mentioned this to Will on a podcast where everybody was freaking out about the Celtics not being able to just do away with the Heat and do away with the Cavs, but winning by 30 points every game. That's what everyone was expecting. And I said, well, the Celtics don't have to play their best basketball until they have to play their best basketball. And when you look across the West, the Nuggets and the Wolves had to be on their P's and Q's much earlier than the Celtics did. And you saw what happened in the Western Conference Finals where the T-Wolves had blew their load straight up, blew their load right. in the semifinals, got to the Western Conference Finals, had nothing yes. for Luka Doncic. And now we see the Celtics get a much better matchup on paper with the Mavs despite, you know, having to go up against Luca, who might be the best player in the world and Kyrie, who's got all these uh, revenge factors. But will, what are, what are the narratives that, that are standing out to you? 
Uh, I mean, I think S hit on a, a lot of them from like the the team perspective. I do think it's funny that like you know I think Drew Carter mentioned this on a on a different podcast. Who's the Celtics play by play guy, soon to be the full time play by play guy, and uh, you know everyone talks about the Kyrie versus Boston. But then, you know, it, it was a little bit longer ago, but there's still a lot of angst in Dallas about KP, right? Yeah. Like in, in the KP storyline, both that and will he play? Because we still don't have a definitive answer. And that's going to be somewhat clouding a lot of this preview that we do is there's going to be a lot of if this, if KP plays, then this is what to watch for. But if he doesn't, then we watch for this. So I, I think especially leading up to it, Chris Dapps Porzingis is just is just the answer because there's so much unanswered about, you know, his status on the court. And then, you know, some of the relation stuff, relationship stuff with him in Dallas was a little bit weird because I do remember when the trade happened with Chris Dapps going to uh, from New York to Dallas. I remember I was it was at the time I was I can't remember what job I was at, but I had a good friend uh, who was a Mavericks fan. And I was like, dude you just got the new Stockton Malone, but like the Euro version of whatever <laughs> this new age looks like, you know what I mean? Like, like this yeah. was going to be at that time. It was like mind blowing to think about the age and trajectory that you could have Luca and KP working together. And it just never worked out. And, you know, a lot of that was, was KP's injury history, but there was also a lot of, you know, behind the scenes relationships stuff that I'm not, you know, fully well versed on, but I'm sure a lot more of that is going to come out. So I, I think just, the Chris Dapps Porzingis of it all is really for me the the main storyline that I'm looking at as how much and we'll get into this as we start going into kind of like the position by position analysis and there's going to be a lot of crossover with these teams because these two teams have guys that are all super versatile but yeah. I'm curious for you you know KP being available or not available how much does that swing your opinion of what this series looks like a uh, big time man big time I mean I I still uh spoiler alert here but i still think the celtics will be winning this series regardless of how the kp situation falls out i just think it depends on how easily they win this series uh with with kp that being said you brought up an interesting point about how kp is sort of the starting point of this whole thing both from a schematic point and from a narrative perspective and it's funny because you can kind of draw a through line from the kp trade to Jalen Brunson, to flopping on Jalen Brunson and not signing him, and then mm -hmm. to Kyrie. And so right. there's this sort of Just like desperation. That was right. a desperation move to go get Absolutely. Kyrie. Absolutely. Yeah, big time. time. Yeah, big time. I mean, look, there was no one who was willing to trade for Kyrie. And the Mavericks were like, hey, we, we got to do something. You know, Luka is, is growing unhappy. And that's that's why this Mavericks team is so, so fascinating because it's like they just – it just happened. You know, if you go back on this, I think – in 10 years, when we look back at this Mavs team, we'll be like, man, the circumstances that were required for this team to make it to the finals is is pretty incredible. Um, that being said, I think I think from a schematic point of view, you look at KP, his ability to you know stretch the floor is obviously one thing, but also um, sort of punish these switches in, in the post. And I'm sure you guys have talked about that ad nauseum when it comes to just the Celtic season in general but the way he makes them hum offensively is going to be huge I think the defensive factor against Luka to you know playing that deep drop and and being willing to have Drew and Derek White kind of chase over like it just he's kind of the security blanket for the Celtics in a lot of ways um and I think that's where you see this maybe go from five to six or six seven depending on when KP is available